God bless you. And thank you for being a genuine follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I want to study what the Bible says about endurance and what it means to really hang in there and be faithful. Now, it is good to glance back at the examples of the cloud of Old Testament witnesses. We've done that. I believe it's more important that you and I fix our eyes on Jesus, to keep our gaze on Jesus Christ. Now, the key phrase in today's passage is, let us run with endurance. There's that word, run with endurance the race that is set before us. In the book of Hebrews, as in many places of the New Testament, the phrase, let us, usually refers to believers. It can refer as well to unbelievers. Now, in Hebrews 12, verse 1, the phrase, let us, may be referring to Israelites, Jewish men and women who have made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. But some might still have one foot remaining in Judaism and one foot in Christianity. They may not have begun to really run the race, which is what I want to talk about today. These truths apply primarily to those who are wanting to live for Christ and run the race of Christianity. These truths do apply to men and women who are seeking truth. They're not yet followers of Christ, but they are seeking the truth. God actually warned Israel through the prophet Amos. Amos chapter 6, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure in the mountain of Samaria. Amos chapter 6, verse 1. God was warning his people not to lie around on their beds of ease. You and I, we're to get into the race. We're to run the race. It's strenuous. It's continuous. It takes work. In God's army, we are soldiers who are never commanded at ease. We're to serve the Lord. And to not serve the kingdom of God is to forfeit the prize. We're going to talk about rewards today. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, If any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. 1 Corinthians 3, 14. Endurance means to have a steady determination to keep going. I want that for you today. For Christians, for individual believers, the race, it's a marathon. It's a long distance race. It's not necessarily a sprint. The church has always had many short spurt servants, and they, they rise quickly and they fall quickly. The Lord wants us to make the distance, to run the race. There will be obstacles. There will be pitfalls and speed bumps. There will be times of weariness and exhaustion, but we, we're encouraged to have endurance and to win. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to endure by faith. God will strengthen us. Now, the only time we sin, the only time we fail is when we, we stop trusting the Lord and we take our eyes off of Jesus that is why our protection against Satan's temptation is the shield of faith, Ephesians chapter 6. And we see that as long as we are trusting God and our eyes are on Jesus Christ, doing what he wants us to do, Satan and uh, sin have no power over us. The enemy has no way of hindering our walk with God when we choose faith when we put on the whole armor of God and we renew our mind daily with God's word. When we run in the power of God's spirit with our eyes fixed on Jesus, when we choose to run to win, we run and we win the prize. Amen? Follow along as I read Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses Surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, 
fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and you will not lose heart. And may the Lord add his blessing to the public reading of his word. The first biblical truth is the encouragement to run. Now, we are all creatures of motivation. We're motivated by something, and we need a reason for doing things, and we need encouragement along the way while we are doing them. One of the greatest motivations, uh, especially to the unbelieving Jewish people, as well as to believers of every nationality, would be that faithfulness is rewarded by God, and even faithful servants from the past heroes of the faith who live their lives trusting the Lord. We call this often the cloud of witnesses. Those were men and women who were faithful. They faithfully followed the Lord just as was mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 previously. You and I, we are to run the race of faith like they did, always trusting, never giving up, no matter what the obstacles or hardships or difficulties, or the cost. They knew how to run the race of faith. They opposed Pharaoh. They forsook the pleasures of the courts of Egypt. Remember? They miraculously passed through the Red Sea on dry land. They shouted down the walls of Jericho by faith. It had to feel foolish. But more importantly, they saw the power of God shut the mouths of lions quench the power of fire, receive back their dead by resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, tortured, mocked, scourged, some imprisoned, murdered, stoned, sawn in two. And now the writer of this epistle is telling them, you need to run like they did and not grow weary. It can be done if you choose to run in faith, that's what I want to talk about. The Old Testament saints had less revelation about God than you have. And yet those Old Testament saints were victorious because of their faith in the Lord God Almighty. I do not believe that the cloud of witnesses surrounding us is standing in the galleries of heaven watching as we serve Christ here on planet Earth. These are witnesses to God, not to us. And they are examples, not onlookers. And so we look back to them and we're encouraged by their hardship, by their faith. They proved by their testimony, by their witness, that the life of faith is only the way to live. The only life to live is by faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 and Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so if you want to please God, you're going to walk by faith. To have a whole gallery of such faithful saints looking down, they should motivate us and they should encourage us. And we're, we're not called to please them. We're called to please God. They're not looking at us per se. We are looking to them Nothing is more encouraging than the successful examples of someone who has gone before you. And they've gone before us, seeing how God was with them, how God was faithful to them. It should encourage you to trust the Lord all the more. It does me. Now, the same God who was their God is our God. It's the same God. The God of yesterday is the God of today and will be the God of tomorrow. He never changes. I am the Lord and I change not. God has not grown weak or tired. God has not lost any interest in his people. You can run just as they did. I can run just as they did. But here's the question. Are you in the race? Are you even in the race? Because we have the same God as the Old, Old Testament saints God can do the same things through you and I if 
you and I choose to place our trust in the Most High God. Let's choose faith. Amen? The second biblical truth, the encumbrances that hinder us. Now, one of the greatest problems runners face is weight, burdens. And as the world uh, anticipates the different events and Olympics and track athletes that run, and we, we realize that they have to carefully monitor their own physical condition and especially their weight. You see, just a few extra pounds in a race can cost an athlete a victory. It might even miss qualifying. And I'm going to call that encumbrance. That's what your Bible calls it. And it literally means to have a bulk or a mass of something. It is not necessarily bad in itself unless you're running the race. Often it's something perfectly innocent or harmless but it weighs us down, it diverts our attention, it drains us of energy, it will it'll steal you of your enthusiasm and the things for God. So we cannot win the race if we're carrying excess weight. And that's the things that we accumulate in life that weigh us down. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Now, let me lay out the problem. The problem is not in what the weight is, but in what the weight does in our ability to run the race. It prevents us from winning the race. It keeps us from running well and, and therefore from doing what this scripture has said, and that is win. The Galatian church struggled with this, and it really is a, a self-inventory, a spiritual inventory in, in my life to, to really examine myself. The third biblical truth, the sin which so easily entangles us. And we are to lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. This is an even more significant hindrance to the Christian life. Now, you're saved. You're, you're bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. The penalty of your sins have been paid for. The reference here may be to sin in general, but the phrase, the sin, it seems to indicate a particular sin or a besetting sin. If there is one particular sin that hinders the race of faith, I believe it's unbelief, doubting God, <clears throat> doubting and living by faith and, and, and contradicting the things that God has given to us. Mark 9 verse 24, I do believe, help me in my unbelief. Now that's a familiar prayer in Mark 9 24. Unbelief entangles the believer's feet so that he or she cannot run to win. So if you're going to run the race to win, you cannot be entangled by unbelief because unbelief wraps itself around us and it trips us up. We stumble over it when we're trying to run the race for the Lord and we're not able to. Unbelief easily entangles us when we allow sin into our lives and doubt and confusion. And as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I, we are to run the race to win. Amen? Now keep in mind, Satan does not want you to run to win. In fact, he wants you to run in circles. And so we have to run to win. The fourth biblical truth answers that. It's Jesus. He's the example to follow. So in running, as in most sports, where you fix your eyes is extremely important. Nothing will throw you off stride or slow you down like looking at your feet or looking behind you or to the left or the right or looking at the crowd in the stands. The Christian race is a lot like this. You have to purpose where your eyes are going to go. And let me just say, keep your eyes on Jesus. Some followers of the Lord Jesus Christ are preoccupied with their own lives, with themselves. And I'm not saying that they are necessarily selfish, 
But what I am saying is they're paying too much attention to what, what they're accumulating or achieving or the, the ladder they're climbing. It's a temporary short-term gain. There is no place for selfishness. In fact, the place is to focus on others, on Jesus and others and then yourself. We are to fix our eyes first and foremost on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter and the finisher of our faith. We are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're to be, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we're filled with God's Spirit, it causes our eyes to be fixed on Jesus. We're not looking to the left or the right, but we're looking at victory, which the Lord brings into our life. The Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 14. If we, if we focus truly on Jesus, we'll see everything else in right perspective. He gives us a right perspective. And when our eyes are on the Lord Jesus, then the Holy Spirit has an opportunity, a, a wonderful opportunity to use us and to help us to endure, to keep running, and to run the race to win. You and I, we are to focus on Jesus because he is the author. He is the perfecter of our faith and it takes faith to win. Jesus is the, the, the example that we follow. He's the supreme example. In Hebrews chapter two, verse 10, Jesus, he's called the author of our salvation. And Jesus is not only the author of our faith, but he's the perfecter of our faith. He's our savior and master. Jesus Christ, while hanging on the cross of Calvary in agony and shame, he continued to trust his father until he could finally say, it is finished. John 19, verse 30, it is finished. Along with, with father into thy hands, I commit my spirit. These are the last words, the dying words of Jesus Christ while hanging on the cross. His work of salvation was finished. Redemption was complete. And he was waiting on the Lord. And if, a, if you and I can trust the Lord, there's just so many ma marvelous things that we can accomplish. We can live in faith. And the way cross, Christ finished his life on the cross, he finished obediently. And in his life, he accomplished what the Father had wanted him to do. God the Father wants you to run the race. From birth to death, Jesus did his Father's will. Jesus' life was totally committed to the Father's will. He ran the race. And that's the example we're looking at in Hebrews chapter 12. There's never been a life like Jesus's. His life of faith, that's what we look at. Now, there's a fifth biblical truth and that's the end of the race. Some of you may be nearing the end of the race. Jesus did not run his race of faith for the pleasure of running or the pleasure of the race itself, though Jesus must have experienced great satisfaction in seeing people healed and people brought to faith and comforted. But Jesus, when he left his father's presence, the splendor of heaven, the glory of heaven, he endured temptation and fierce opposition by Satan himself. He suffered ridicule and scorn and blasphemy and torture and crucifixion, the death of crucifixion by his enemies, as well as the experience of being misunderstood and the denial of his own disciples for the sake of whatever few pleasures and satisfactions that, that, that they would have received. But Jesus was motivated, now listen carefully, Jesus was motivated by this, this immeasurable desire to please his Father. What could have possibly motivated the Lord Jesus Christ to run in such a way? It was to obey his Father in heaven. Only what was at the end of the race could have motivated Jesus to leave the splendor of heaven and endure the agony of the cross and and the pain of planet earth, and the humility being fully God and fully man. Jesus Christ ran the race for two things, and here they are. It's recorded in your Bible. The joy set before him and 
sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus ran for the joy of exaltation. It's recorded in John chapter 17. I glorified thee on the earth. It's Jesus praying to God the Father. I glorified thee on the earth, having accomplished the work which thou hast given me to do. And now glorify thou me together with thyself, Father, with the glory which I ever had with thee before the world was. John chapter 17, verses 4 and 5. Jesus gained his reward by glorifying his Father while he was here on earth. Jesus glorified God by totally exhibiting the Father's attributes and by fully doing the Father's will. The prize that believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are to run for, it's not just heaven. If we're truly followers of Jesus Christ, think about it. Heaven's already guaranteed. It's a gift. It's God's free gift. John 10, 28 and 29, and I give eternal life. Notice gift. And I give eternal life to them. And they shall never perish. And no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. John chapter 10, verse 28 and 29, and Jesus would go on to say, I and the Father are one. Now, when you and I run the race, it's for the prize that Jesus ran for. We can achieve it in the same way Jesus did. When we run to win, we run for the joy of exaltation that God promises that will be ours if we glorify God here on earth as his son Jesus did. You and I, we glorify God by allowing his attributes to shine through us and by obeying his will in everything we do. When we anticipate the heavenly reward of faithful service, his joy becomes your joy. And the apostle Paul spoke of his converts in like manner. In Philippians chapter 4, he talked about joy and crown. That's a reward. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, hope, joy, and crown of exaltation. That's what we're running for, the hope and the joy and the crown of exaltation. Jesus had present joy because of future promises, and faith allows us to see the future as if it is here today. What gives us joy in this life is the confidence of God's word and God's promised reward in heaven. It's not just heaven we're looking forward to. It's the rewards that God promises to overcomers, those who live above uh, life's challenges. And it will be worth it all when we get to heaven. Now, when Jesus went to the cross, he endured all that it demanded. It was terrible. Jesus despised the shame and yet accepted it willingly for the sake of his father's reward and for the joy, that anticipation that this reward brings and the glory to follow. So as you run the race, if you choose to get in the race as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, you can run with joyful anticipation of that same reward, the crown of righteousness, which one day you can just cast back at Jesus' feet as evidence of the eternal love that you had for Christ. You know, I, I rarely have six biblical truths, but I do today. And it's one more exhortation to endure. It's a final exhortation to endure. When we get weary in the race, and we do, when our faith gets weak, and it does, I want you to think back to God and his everlasting strength. And I want you to realize he'll, he'll get you out of every mess, out of all of your foolishness, he'll deliver you. And you can hang on to him. And you can realize that we consider him Christ, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. I don't want you to grow weary. I don't want you to lose heart. I want you to 
fix your eyes on Jesus. And I want you to reason together with him. And I want you to reconsider that cloud of witnesses from the Old Testament and the strength and courage they demonstrated. You can have that strength and courage. You are courageous. I want you to be a follower of Christ and demonstrate great faith. Now, nothing we ever are called to, to endure can compare to what Jesus Christ endured. Wow, what he did on the cross for your sins and mine, Jesus, the divine son of God, while here on earth, he did not live in his own power, but it was in God's power. The father, that's the secret. I've just given it to you. You live in the power of Abba, the father. Jesus' example will encourage you. That great cloud of witnesses will encourage you. But it's the power of faith and trusting in your Father who will not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I've spoken to believers. Running the race is definitely for believers. Maybe you've been listening and you've never really trusted Christ. I don't know if you've trusted Christ or not, but you do. You know if you're a Christian or if you're not. If you're not a Christian, what in the world are you waiting for? Why are you still on the fence? I encourage you to make a decision to trust Christ. Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins. He will. He'll do that exactly. Ask him to write your name into the Lamb's book of life. That's exactly what he'll do. Commit yourself to follow Christ. Surrender your life to him and make him your Messiah, your Savior. Do it today and become a genuine follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to live courageously and live boldly for Christ. I want you to run the race, get in the race, and run to win. Until we meet again, live for Christ. Haven't I commanded you? Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened.